Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to today's show. This is Jason Hartman, your host. And as you may or may not know, every 10th show, we kind of do a special tradition here that originated with my Creating Wealth show, where we do a topic that is actually off topic on purpose, something just to do with general life and more successful living. And that's exactly what we're going to do today with our special guest. Again, 10th show is off topic, and it is very much intentional just for personal enrichment and I hope you enjoy today's show. And we will be back with our guest in just a moment. Did you know that you can call into the Creating Wealth Show? Yes, you can call me and talk to me direct for later broadcast on the show. The number is 949-200-8009 or via Skype, Jason Hartman, ROI. Please make sure you have a good connection when you call get your questions answered, participate in the show, and share your experiences with other investors. Call in 949-200-8009 or Skype Jason Hartman ROI and participate in the Creating Wealth Show. My pleasure to welcome John Gordon to the show. He is a best-selling author, a internationally known motivational speaker, and he has six books out. And today we're going to talk about all of them, but maybe most particularly his book, The Seed, Finding Purpose and Happiness in Life and Work. John, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. Where are you located? I am in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, which is a near Jacksonville. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us today. So tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired your six books. And you've got quite a bit of notoriety. I know one of your books just hit the USA Today bestseller list. So congratulations. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I got into writing when I found my purpose. I asked, why am I here? What am I born to do? I was really struggling in my life back then. It was about 11 years ago. I struggled in my marriage, my personal life. Everything seemed to be falling apart. And in that moment, I said, okay, I know I'm here for a reason. I know I'm here for more because I'm certainly not happy. I Actually, in many ways, I was miserable. And writing and speaking just kept on coming to me. So I had been in the restaurant business. I had owned a number of restaurants. I also was in technology. I was in politics, nonprofit work, graduate of Cornell University, went to Emory, had my master's in teaching. So I've had a various background. But once I started to write and speak, I literally found my calling. And The Energy Bus was the first book I wrote. And that book really got out there. Not right away, but, but over time it got out there. And more and more people started to you know, benefit from the message of positivity, of overcoming negativity, of this positive energy that we live with that actually transforms so our lives and also makes a difference in the lives of others. So that really started me on this journey of speaking to all these different companies and organizations. And then along the way, I've written you know, different books as ideas come to me, as I get a vision of what I'm supposed to write. And the seed is something that, that really was powerful and that it came to me about purpose and the purpose that, that we're all searching for to live in our life. In many ways, the main character, Josh, he's 27 years old. He's lost his passion for his job, and he's given two weeks off by his boss. So he goes to a corn maze with his buddies, and while he's in the corn maze, he gets lost. And he meets a farmer who gives him a seed and says, find out where to plant the seed, and your purpose will be revealed to you. And so he goes on this journey to find out where to plant the seed to find his purpose. And I really believe that's the journey we all take to find and live and share our purpose. So when you, when you talk about the energy bus, I mean, is it good old-fashioned positive thinking? Maybe kind of drive down a little bit and, and tell us what your general philosophy is maybe. Sure, sure. Well, it's about the first, it's a story. It's a fable about a guy who was miserable and negative based on me. His name is George. 
His team at work is in disarray. He has problems at home. Wakes up to this flat tire, and so he has to take the bus to work. And he gets on the bus, and he meets Joy, the bus driver. And she and a cast of characters teach him the ten rules for the ride of his life that that not only help him become a more positive leader, a better father, but it's really about getting his team on the bus and moving in the right direction. So it's really about positive leadership, the kind of leadership that, that, that shares a vision, that gets people excited about the vision, then gets everyone on the bus together to buy in, to be engaged, and then moving in the right direction as you go forward with a shared vision, focus, and purpose. But along the way, George and his, and his team at work, they have to overcome adversity. They have to overcome what I call energy vampires. They have to overcome negativity. So it's not the Pollyanna positive. It's not the, that, that fake positive thinking we're talking about. We're talking about you know, real mental toughness, real resiliency, real heartfelt optimism that ultimately defines great leaders in their organizations. Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, was asked the most important characteristic of a leader, and he said optimism. Because optimists create the future, not pessimists. It's the optimist. Optimists create wealth. Optimists build great businesses. But, but it's the optimism that allows them and helps them and empowers them to overcome all the negativity along the way that will help them be successful. So that's really the defining message. Uh, of course I agree with you, and I think everybody listening would, but is there a technique for optimism? I mean, what were some of the rules that these people shared with your character on the, on the energy bus? And, right. and, and is optimism a feeling or is it a technique? Is it a, a, a strategy, a, a more technical right. thing? Or is it just something either, you know, you kind of have or you don't? I mean, certainly I think th- there must be something inherent, innate, genetic, whatever word you want to use, because I believe that some people just generally are more optimistic than others. And maybe some have to work at it and learn it and exercise the optimism muscle. Yes, great, great question, and also a, a great point. You know, the research shows that some of us are born more pessimistic, more negative than others, and some of us are born happier, more positive. And so the research shows that to be true. But the research also shows that we can mold our brain, we can develop it, we can cultivate an optimistic mindset. And, and the way it happens ultimately is through our perspective, our perspective, our attitude, the way we see the world. So my latest book just came out. It's actually my seventh book. It just came out. It's called The Positive Dog. And it takes a premise and a story from the energy bus about whichever dog you feed the most inside you is the one that grows. So feed the positive dog. And it tells a story about a negative dog who learns to be positive. So it's this fun story with two dogs talking, but I say don't underestimate the message just because it keeps, you know, and, and it features talking dogs. Realize that, that this book shares the science and the benefits and the strategies of being positive. So our optimism today determines our success tomorrow. I truly believe that. And I also believe that we can feed the positive dog and cultivate it through our perspective. Let me give you an example. Every day we go to work, we can focus on get to or have to. And so you could say, I have to go to work, I have to go to this meeting, I have to go do this, or you could say, I get to. And that one perspective changes, you know, complaining or a negative perspective with a one of gratitude and appreciation. We can be stressed or we can be thankful. And the research shows that you cannot be stressed and thankful at the same time. So when you are practicing gratitude, you will not be stressed. And so we can feed ourselves with these perspectives. When you experience a challenge. How do you perceive that challenge? Some see it as the end of their life, of their business, of their world. Others see it as an opportunity to learn and grow. Like in my family, we look at loss, L-O-S-S, as learning opportunity, stay strong. So when we lose, when we fail, because we do, we say, okay, how can we learn from this? How can we grow from it? How can we can become better for it? Gallup did a study, and they asked people to identify the worst event in their life and the best event. And they found there was an 80% correlation between the two that the worst event leads to the best if you're willing to learn and grow from the experience. It just it reminds me, John, of that movie, Yes Man, with Jim Carrey. And I think that there's so many valuable life lessons in that movie is that I think when one views 
optimism the way you just explained it and, and views situations the way you just explained it, they're willing to fail more often. They're willing to try more things because they don't have this mindset that failure is this devastating thing or loss is this devastating thing. It's a learning experience. And every time, at least in recent years in my life, uh, certainly not every time in my life, but everything that happens to me, I just kind of think, I, I kind of just go with it at the time. Don't get too upset about it, whatever happens, you know, if it would be perceived normally as negative. And then I just look back, even in just a couple of hours or a couple of days, certainly the perspective of a couple of months or years changes everything, of course, and, and, and time heals all, almost all wounds, I'd say. But, like, if that didn't happen, then this other thing wouldn't have happened. Right. And the other thing made me learn this, and that prepared me for this next thing that wouldn't have worked out so well if that thing didn't happen <laughs> in the first place, you know? <laughs> right. Well, well, losing my job during the dot-com crash was ultimately the catalyst for for doing the work that I do now. So it was the worst event in my life. But ultimately, it led to the best event. So you're exactly right. It's When we look back, we see it. Now, when we're going through it, it's not easy. But again, our perspective and how we view it allows us to overcome it. So if it, if it rains, for example, I share this analogy all the time. If it rains, how do you respond to the rain? That's actually an example, not an analogy. But how do you respond to the rain? Do you, do you say, oh, I hate the rain. I'm, I'm, I'm getting wet. You start complaining because a lot of people do. And then there's that person that says, oh, my garden needed it. My grass needed it. I'm so thankful it's raining. I love the rain coming down on my, on my, on my head and my body. And it just, it's refreshing. And so the same event happens to do different people. And how you think about that event will then determine your attitude, your thoughts, your feelings as you then go throughout the day and how you interact with others. My wife is Irish. I have been to an Irish funeral that was a more uh, exciting party than any wedding I've ever been to. Leave because, it to the Irish. That doesn't right, surprise me. <laughs> yeah, they, they, look at, they look at that event as a celebration of their life whereas others may look at it as a deep grief and mourning. Now, that doesn't mean we trivialize death and say, oh, it's a good thing, right? But that perspective at least helps them deal with that horrible event of that person's, of what they're dealing with, and they celebrate the life rather than focus on the death. Talk to us about purpose, if you would. And in, in your book, The Seed, I notice you have a chapter, Dogs Have a Purpose. And, you know, I'm a big dog lover. I uh, yeah. have dogs for many years. And, you know, how does one find one's purpose? And what is the tie-in with dogs? Right. Well, I love dogs. And I, and I just, you know, love the way they act. And I think dogs know more than we think they know. And so when I wrote The Seed, Josh goes on this journey to find his purpose with his dog. And his dog, Dharma, which means purpose or calling, his dog shares thoughts, you know, through the, the narration of the book about what the dog is thinking. So you hear the dog's thoughts as you're, as you're reading this book. And it's interesting because the dog believes that dogs have a purpose, that humans have a purpose, that everyone is ultimately here for a purpose. And it's that purpose and that passion that drives you. Now, the way we find it, we often think it's something out there. But a key message of the book is that you are the seed. Plant yourself where you are. Decide to serve and make a difference where you are. You want to grow? Then plant yourself first because seeds have to be planted for things to grow. And then once you plant yourself, serve and make a difference. If you're in sales, make a difference with your clients. Make that your priority. If you do, and that is your purpose to serve them, your business will grow. It's a, it's a byproduct. So many people are, are seeking happiness. No, decide to work with passion and purpose and happiness will find you. Stop chasing success. Young people are always chasing success. No, decide to make a difference and success finds you. And I see this over and over again in organizations and businesses and sports. True success happens when we plan ourselves and really become someone who provides value, who serves, who focuses on the root of the tree and then they get the fruit. But if you focus on the fruit and you focus on the numbers and you ignore the root, what happens? The tree dies. So it's about nurturing that root, which is your purpose and passion. And if you do that, everything else will, will take care of itself. Very good point. So, so don't chase success. Chase significance. Yes. And success will come as a natural result, right? Yes. It's a, again, it's about serving 
and making a difference and being a value. I met a mortgage broker, for instance, who she sees her job as saving marriages because if she know she knows that if she can, <laughs> that's an amazing it, connection, by yes, the way. <laughs> but here's what she says: she says that if I can help people keep their homes, which I do, then I know that will keep their marriage intact. And she's one of the tops in her company. My mom, who passed away five years ago at the age of 59, she was a realtor. My mom was not in the business to make money. She just took care of her people. She loved them. She would walk their dogs when they were away. They loved my mom. She was number one you know, in South Florida as a realtor. So I meet people all the time who have a bigger purpose for what they do. I met a, a teacher. And you know, a lot of teachers get burned out, but this teacher doesn't. Why? Because she sees her job as a ministry. She's there and she's a spiritual person and she's trying to, to really serve the, the heart and the soul of a, of, a, of a child to help them be all that they're meant to be. And so she sees that as her job and she doesn't get burned out. See, here's what I found. We get burned out not because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. And so whatever you do, Money will not motivate you in the long run. People think, well, all the research shows that it will not. You must be driven by something more. And I believe it's the purpose that drives you. Yeah, very, very good points. So when, when you talk about uh, purpose and, and, and people having a purpose, I'm curious, what was your job, the job you got fired from maybe, what, 12 years ago or so? Sure. Yeah, I was a, I was a business development for a dot-com company. We were a wireless technology company. I'm the one who actually sold the NFL on, on NFL Wireless. So So they used our technology for the first time to ever create scores on mobile devices where you could actually see an NFL score on a mobile device a number of years ago. Look at how and far we've come in 12 yeah. years. Huh? Oh, yeah. That, and that's, I know. It was amazing, and that's, that's what this company did. And so that was, that was my job. Now, I honestly then wasn't thinking about purpose. When I was with this company, I, I enjoyed trying to you know, create these new uh, relationships to make that happen. But... If I can go back and do it again, I think I would be even more successful with what I know now. And I also you know, own restaurants, and I know that I'd be a much better boss and owner and manager if I, know, you know, if I, if I was able to go back and do uh, what I know now. And, and so tell us about some of your work with various athletes and sports teams. Name names, too, would be interesting. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, no, I'm, I'm ha- happy to share that. And it's public knowledge. If you go to my website, you'll see a bunch of, uh, of the news paper articles on how teams have used it, but that's what I want people to know. This is not Pollyanna. This is stuff that I've, that I've seen really work, and, and it's not like I, this is something I planned. You know, I wrote this book, The Energy Bus, and then from there, people just started reading it, started using it, and then I started hearing all these stories. Then I got to meet with all these different leaders of companies and coaches of teams. I've actually learned from them in many ways as well as shared with them. So I've learned and grown with them. And then that's made me overall, again, a better leader and a better teacher to, to share them more. So, for instance, the Atlanta Falcons, I've worked with them the last four years. Mike Smith brought me in the energy bus in after the whole Michael Vick thing. And he utilized the energy bus to help turn around the culture of the Atlanta Falcons and to engage his team. So all the players read the book at least most of them anyway, <laughs> you might not have read it. And then uh, from there, I spoke to the team, and, and then they embraced the principles. They went from like 4 and 12 to, to a winning season, making the playoffs, and have made the playoffs every year thus far. Then worked with the Jacksonville Jaguars, actually before the Atlanta Falcons, and then I worked with the Texas Longhorns the year they went to the national championship. I worked with the Georgia Bulldogs this year. I love the story of working with them because Mark Richt uh, is such a great guy and a great coach. He had... The team read the energy bus. I spoke to the team, and what happened was they lost the first two games. And everyone was saying their season was over. They were done. I sent Mark a text. I was pretty concerned because I'm thinking I hurt this team by speaking to them. And next thing you know, I said, I still believe in you guys. He texted me back and said, John, the guys are staying on the bus. They're staying positive. They're not allowing negativity to bring them down. No energy vampires here. Sure enough, they went on to win the next 10 games in a row, and they made it to the SEC championship. And I hear that over and over again. The Celtics, uh, Doc Rivers, this year gave the energy bus to his team, and they all read the book. The 76ers actually have read Training Camp. That was an article in, in the paper in Philly that I saw that they're all reading Training Camp uh, at the beginning of the season this year. So I have the Sixers playing the Celtics this year. One's read Energy Bus, one's read Training Camp. So it's interesting to see how they do. So I, I get to work with a lot of these different coaches and teams and college t- coaches. And, uh, again, I love the principles because 
in a sports game, you could tell right away whether this team is living it, embracing it, and whether it works. You can tell in a, in a short season whether these principles work, whether this is truly a team or a collection of individuals. And that's what I love what you can see with sports, whether they work or not. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. The price, only $197. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. In light of what you said earlier in our discussion today, talk to us for a moment, if you would, about what you tell them when you come in and you start working with uh, a sports team. What is it you're you're telling with them? What what are your discussions with them like? Sure. Because like we were talking about purpose a few minutes ago. What is that purpose? I mean, it's to entertain. It's to it's to push limits and and to be the best one can be and and go beyond the physical pain and, and endurance that's required for athletics. What do you actually say to them? How does yeah. it work? We talk one on culture first off. Culture. My book Soup is based on creating a culture of greatness. So we'll talk about creating a culture of greatness. How culture drives behavior. Behavior drives habits. Habits create the future. So we say you win in the locker room first and then you win in the field. So we talk about the importance of culture. Then we talk about the importance of optimism and staying positive. And I say that staying positive is a competitive advantage. So we talk about negativity. We talk about energy vampires and that decision to stay positive impacts the team. And you'll get guys coming up to me afterwards saying, man, I needed that. I've been really thinking negative lately. And I get that in businesses too. You know, I just heard from UPS, uh, uh, one of the leaders of UPS on the, on the Northwest region in Seattle. And they have now had 700 of their managers in the Northwest region read the energy bus. And they literally can track performance and production results from the time that they read the book and used the book and they can see the growth in their production and performance. I'm so excited to hear that because now we have some numbers that actually show this really works you know, from a business standpoint. I've heard so many examples from businesses that it's worked. I've worked with also school districts where I've seen uh, performance increase in schools and teachers and students. But, but now we have, you know, again, some real numbers to show that. Okay, so, so culture, culture, the, culture, yeah, culture is culture, the first thing. Yeah, so, so we got culture. Then we have optimism, staying positive, overcoming the negativity dealing with the energy vampires, not allowing negativity to ruin the team. Then we move from there. To let me, let me ask you a question on that before yeah. you go on, John. How should one deal with energy vampires? Because we've all, hopefully we're not this person, but uh, you know, we've all dealt with people and experienced people in our lives who are the energy vampires. Someone who can brighten a room just by leaving it. <laughs> yeah. You know? And my wife will, will say that I used to be that energy vampire. She gave me this book. She said, we should read it together. It's called Have a New Husband by Friday. So, <laughs> so you know, I was an energy vampire at one point in my life, so I know it well. So how do we deal with them? One, I think we can try to, we try to encourage them. We try to, to get them on the bus. A lot of people give energy vampires, you know, the energy bus and say, here, read this. And so we can give them other books. We can give them, you know, materials to read, positive things to say, hey, look at this. Think of it this way. That doesn't always work as we know. You know, not everyone is going to get on the bus. And you also can't drive anyone else's bus. You may have a neighbor that's really negative. Sometimes it's best to actually just stay away from those people for your own good, right? For your own positivity. Then there are times at work where you can't get away from that energy vampire. You have to deal with them. Well, in those instances, and you can't fire them and you're not in control of that, you have to be more positive than the negativity you face. Basically, that's it. Your positive energy must be greater than their negativity, convinced by your presence, as Walt Whitman said. And the more you are positive and truly positive, and you don't allow them to impact you and your negativity, you will have an influence over them. I've seen it happen over and over again. Now, at the cultural level, if you are a manager, you are a boss, then you have to use all means possible to make sure that you do not allow energy vampires to exist in the organization. I believe everyone has the right to go to work to be their best, and they shouldn't have to deal with negative Nelly or negative Sam next to them being negative. 
And so you have to make sure that the culture level, you say, hey, we're going to be a positive organization. Now, it also means that you shouldn't have fighting. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have fighting. It doesn't mean you should have conflict. That's Pollyanna. You do have to have disagreements. You do have to have fights. So I'm not saying have yes men in your organization. I'm saying you can't have people that sabotage the organization. It's a little different. People who actually provide conflict that contribute to growth, that's not a vampire. But someone who sucks the energy out of people and, and the team and everyone, you know who they are, those are the ones that you have to deal with. You address them. You confront them. You invite them on the bus. If they don't get on, then you do have to let them off. Okay, so go on. You were ta- That's the energy vampire. The energy vampire part, negativity, staying positive. And then the next one, I speak to teams, you know, again, same thing in businesses, the same kind of talk. But, the, but then we move towards, towards a purpose. And we talk about why do you do what you do and helping them understand that this bigger purpose for your business, for, your, for what you do will drive you. And so if you're not sure what that purpose is, well, then ask yourself, what kind of legacy do I want to leave? You know, what kind of difference do I want to make? Because knowing how you want to be remembered helps you decide how to live today. And I, I would think with athletics, the one I, w- I wish more athletes and public figures in general would embrace is, is being a role model, setting oh, yeah. that example. You know, we, yeah, I, we've, I mean, we have so yeah. many bad examples in our culture. Yeah, and you know what? In talking to a lot of these guys, many of them play for their families. They play to provide for their families. Some are really religious. They play to glorify God. Other guys that I meet, you know, they are playing to be the best that they can be. So it's, it's about excellence. And others, you know, it's about playing for a loved one or, you know, the memory of someone. So for each guy and each girl, you know, it's, it's, it's different. But I do try to encourage them to think of, you know, why you do what you do. And when you get an injury, when you have a setback, What's going to motivate you? Because the paycheck isn't the motivator. Or when you've got a big contract, like Matt Ryan or one of these quarterbacks. You know, Matt Ryan I see every year. He, I think he had a $60 million contract. Matt is not motivated by the money. He is motivated by excellence, by striving to be the best that he can be. Money, he can care less about that. This guy truly wants to get better every day, and that's what he focuses on. So it's really ultimately having a, you know, a purpose that, that drives you, a passion that drives you, and, and a lot of times it's to be the best. A lot of times these guys just want to be the best that they can be. And I'm, I'm, I, I would like a loftier purpose, but I'm just being honest. Some of them it's just, hey, I want to be the best, and that drives them. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, what else? Well, then you move to excellence. So excellence is, is really about getting better every day. It's about being humble and hungry. It's about learning, growing, improving. It's about outworking your competition. It's about outworking your talent, as Kevin McHale says. So knowing that you have talent, but you know what? You will not get to the top of your game unless you're infusing that talent with a passion and desire and, and hard work. So we talk about excellence. We talk about tuning out distractions because a, a lot of these folks are distracted. I mean, they get so many distractions. So it's about tuning out distractions to be their best. And I actually talk a lot about that in training camp, about Zoom focusing. Training camp is the 11 winning habits that separate the best from the rest. And it's, it's these winning habits that, that, I, that it's a sports story, but I interviewed salespeople, business folks, coaches, athletes, artists, you name it, and I found that they all shared the same characteristics. And so we, we talk about that as well. And these characteristics are characteristics of excellence. Great stuff, John. Great stuff. But maybe kind of last thought that I wanted to cover with you is, I, I'm sure you're familiar with, and maybe this was part of your transition, was studying sort of the old guard of, of the PMA or positive mental attitude, positive thinking world. So when you, when you look back to good old Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale, even Zig Ziglar and, and Maxwell Maltz and, you know, all of those greats of the past, Norman Vincent Peale uh, would be another great one. Would you say that the, the concept of positive attitude, has that evolved much or is it that these, these old classic rules are really just the same thing, but maybe rephrased in a more contemporary fashion that relates to people. Yeah, I would say that, that anything that is a false truth, that is a fad, doesn't last. And if it's new, it's not truth. <laughs> because anything that is truth is actually old and sound and firm and from the origins. So I would say that there hasn't been much change in the concepts of positive mental attitude, which really come out of the Bible, believe it or not. 
And so I would say it comes from the Bible and it comes from, again, I believe it comes from God that, that wants us to be more positive. Now, it's just repackaged differently in a more contemporary way, as you say. So the energy bus, it's funny, I did a talk in California and uh, Brian Buffini's event, and he did a whole thing on, on Think and Grow Rich. And I realized that all the principles of Think and Grow Rich were the same principles I wrote about in the energy bus, same principles. And I never read Think and Grow Rich. And yet it had the same principles except one. I added one that he didn't have. I added love your passengers. And if you study Napoleon Hill, what you find is that all the people that he, he wrote about in Think and Grow Rich, their personal lives were a disaster. Yes, they were wealthy. Yes, they made a lot of money, but their personal lives were a disaster. And so adding love your passengers, about love being the foundation of great relationships and great teamwork and ultimately lifelong catalyst for growth in yourself and others, that's a big part that, that he didn't have. So I would say a lot of my work is, is, is very similar, but also in a new way, a new approach. And I've never read Norman Vincent Peale before I wrote my books. I never read any of these thinkers. So that's how I know I'm really called to do this, because I'm writing about things that, that are truth and very similar to the past, and yet I never even read those books. Well, hey, John, give out your website, if you would, and tell people where they can learn more. Sure, johngordon.com, J-O-N, gordon.com. And if you go to that website, you'll find, like, a useful tools page and a lot of free tools. And we have a free positive tip newsletter that we send out every week with a positive message that's relevant to, to work and, and, and life that we want to inspire others with. Fantastic. Yeah, the positive tools section is great. You've got the discussion guides and the manifesto, a bunch of articles, audio tips, videos, a lot of great stuff there. So, John Gordon, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.